so um yeah hello everyone good evening and yeah thank you for joining me on your saturday evening um giving a talk like this online is a slightly strange experience i'm kind of hoping that there's no planes going over otherwise i'm gonna have to pause for a little while but let's yeah there's one just starting now just so i say that and i will keep an eye on the chat so if you've got any questions while i'm talking i'll try and keep an eye out for any of those now let me just see if i can share the screen correctly so let's kick off so learning new skills in j hipster so firstly just to introduce myself a little bit my name's james and i've been at my dear about three months i've been a java developer for about um well over 20 years now so i started out just back before the internet age kicked off which is a really interesting point to have started being a Java, Java developer. I've mostly spent my career on back end, but I've dabbled in building UIs. I've also dabbled in a little bit in Android. And probably like one of my career highlights was many years ago building one of the first app based dating, um, dating sites in the UK. So that was way back and a lot of fun. And yeah, today I'm going to talk about J Hipster. So J Hipster is a tool that I've become very, very excited about over the last few years and basically it's um it's a it's an application generator what it does is it's a pile of scripts that takes away a lot of the sort of regular kind of repeated work of creating an application i think this is a really interesting way a to build applications because it saves some of the boring stuff but also an interesting way to learn i figure there's two ways to learn a new skill the first one is you know picking out the small details and kind of building up larger and larger examples. And that's really good for getting a firm, basic, a firm basis of the principles involved and how it works. But at the same time, there's also the other angle of how do you put something together? And I think the same to be said for facing all the problems that you'd have putting a website live from start to finish. And both these ways of learning are really important, but it's very easy to neglect that one of actually building something. The problem is that particularly when you're starting out, building an application can be quite tricky. So let's start with this question of um, how do you put web, a Java web application live? So say that I've got an idea of something, a simple game that I want to write or a fun website or just a little app I want to build for a few friends to share. To go from that idea to actually producing something, it's not just a case of writing the code to do the thing we're interested in. We have a whole host of other questions to answer. So every site we work on involves things like user security, which has all these kind of intricate aspects to it. You have to set up the database or some sort of data store. I think pretty much any interesting website is going to have some data stored somewhere. You've got to have the stacks for that. So if we're talking Java, you have all the Java code that reads the database and provides the information in a way it can be explained in the front end. If you're trying to do that, you're probably going to want some sort of REST endpoint. So um, REST is um, just a way of API design that's become very popular as a simple way of doing it. And it's a great thing to work with, but there's still a lot of just repeated work to do there. And then you've got to create the CRUD pages on the front end. So most applications you're going to build, they're going to have a series of objects, one that represents a user, one that represents, say, a photo, one that represents a comment. And for each of these objects, you need to create the user interface to create that object replace and update it, and if necessary, delete it, along with all the rules that go with that. Now, with Spring, it got a lot better with the invention of Spring Boot. Spring Boot was a much simpler way of very quickly getting web applications built. But even so, it was still something mature. Just take something like security. So this is one of the points I looked at last time. Every time you want to do anything involving the website, you've got the question of, does the user account you're about to create already exist? Does the email address being used look correct? Can we confirm the email address belongs to the person that's trying to create the account? You've got the whole set of flows for um, resetting a password. So you've got to create a temporary token, email it to somebody. When that token gets used, is it still valid, et cetera, et cetera. And particularly with security stuff, it's painstaking work. It's a little boring and it's difficult. I find that if ever I'm trying to set up Spring security from scratch, I tend to get a little bit flummoxed. It never quite works the way I'd like it to. 
And I find myself missing the days of the LAMP stack. So this was Linux as the server, Apache just to catch the web request, pass them to PHP, and the data stored in my SQL. And the great thing about this was, it was sort of a commodity. You could get an account that'd be very simple with um, all these things set up for you. Unfortunately, you know, that's quite a simple way of working, but these days we tend to have things being a lot more sophisticated. So for example, look at a project I had recently, a personal project, pre-J hipster, the amount of technologies involved were massive. Obviously, you've got Java, then you've got things like um, Git as the version control, you've got Gradle as the build tool, Jenkins for continuous integration, different areas of Spring, you've got things like Flyway and Liquibase, you've got all the front end stuff. And this is a lot of technologies to deal with, particularly when you're starting out. And for me, I found this particularly difficult because I'm not much of a designer. Like a lot of back end devs, the front ends I produce look like an atrocity. So for me, trying to deal with things like, I know that Bootstrap or something will make it look a little bit better, but setting up Bootstrap takes me further away from this thing of actually building the idea I want to work on. It just takes away all the kind of fun because I've come up with an idea and think, wow, I've got to do all these things to get there. So a few options were available. There was Spring Initializer. That was Spring attempts, Spring's attempt to do a lot of these basics, but particularly the early versions, which is setting up a project. They took away some of the difficulties, but there's still a long way from an actual working application. Swagger um, were working on something that would generate code from an API, which again, is really promising, particularly since the API gives a clear design for what we're doing, but that wasn't quite what I wanted. There's options such as um, the Play Framework, which is very powerful, but then that take me away from working in Java Spring. And then of course there's Grails, which was um, formerly known as Groovy on Rails, which was based on Ruby on Rails. So very much inspired by that. But for me, because I tend to use Spring in my professional work and Spring's very much a sort of core skill around Java, I want to stick with Spring. It was then that a friend of mine recommended jhipster. Now I'd heard the name jhipster, but I'd actually dismissed it because it just sounded a bit silly. But he explained that he'd used it in his further, um, his previous workplace, and it allowed him to very quickly put together all the things that I was complaining about. It helped me get the security set up quickly, the basic application, and it also set up the front end for me. And Spring, um, Spring Boot is obviously the main way of working with this, but there's also Kotlin and .NET versions being produced. And rather than just Angular, you can also pick React or um, Vue. The first stage was this obviously installing the tools. And one thing I'll say is that there's a really great set of documentation for jhipster, as well as a very enthusiastic community. So that's the place to start. And obviously you need a little familiarity with setting up development tools, et cetera. But it's not too difficult to get this up and going. I'll also say that there are some excellent tutorials on the jhipster website. These 15 minute video where Matt Rabel introduces jhipster, builds an application, shows some of it being developed is fantastic. And I'm gonna show you some of the setup of jhipster, but definitely on the YouTube video, they take a bunch of cussing, a couple of bits where you have to wait. There's a couple of bits that are faster. So half an hour is not quite long enough for me to go into detail, but hopefully I can give you a little bit of a flavor of how jhipster works. So let's look at putting the basics of an application together. So I'm going to switch to my command line. Let's check for that to come up. Okay, a new directory called jhipster. Enter the directory and run the jhipster application. So this then provides us a set of options for creating our application. There's actually three different ways we can build the application. We can use command line switches. We can use a config file, but I think the easiest one to work with is this particular menu. So initially it offers us a choice of a monolithic application or two microservice options. So let's go with a monolithic application. We get to pick the base name of the application, 
we'll go with demo. We want to make it reactive with Spring Web, Web Flux. So this is an, an optional tool. The, the menu is very good at kind of suggesting the defaults as a no, so let's skip that one. The default package name, we'll go for com.mindera.jhipster.mo. What type of authentication do we want to use? So we've got an option of JWT. We can integrate with um, OAuth2 things like Okta, or we can use session authentication. We'll go with the stateless JWT here. Then we got offered a whole range of databases. So hopefully now you're starting to see the options that JHipster gives, particularly if you want to learn or play with the new technology, it'll set these things up in a working setup for you to be able to tinker with. So we've got regular RDBMS in SQL there. We've got Mongo and Couchbase document databases. We've got Cassandra and we've got Neo4j as a document database. So we'll go with SQL. We get another choice of production databases. So we'll go with MySQL again. And then it says, what development database do we want to use? So we can use MySQL, we can use H2 in memory, or we can use H2 disk-based. The disk-based version I find easy to work with because it keeps all the data in, um, in between instantiations. So it's easier to debug issues with. We got asked another question about caches. So a whole range of different caches. We've got a single node because we're doing a monolith. So let's pick the first option. Do you want the Hibernate second level cache? Again, pick yes. Get a choice of Maven or Gradle for building the back end. We'll go with Gradle. Do you want to use the JHipster registry? So this is a separate tool that can be used to monitor the application and, and help you run it. We'll go with no in this case. Another set of technologies to integrate. So again, there's a whole load of things that you can actually play with in context with this. Skip that. Frameworks, I'll pick Angular. Um, Angular was the first framework, JavaScript framework I learned with. And it's very much, for me, it's familiar as a Java dev. So while I'm aware that React is slightly cooler, let's go with Angular. Do we want an admin UI? Yes, we do. And then we get a series of options. So we'll go with the default theme. And here we have an option for initialization. So the main language, we pick English. And then for the additional languages, we'll pick Portuguese. So that already sets the application up to use multiple languages. There's a whole choice of testing frameworks. Again, I'll skip those for now. And do we want to install other generators? Not for this example. At this point, we've completed our startup and JHips then starts churning through, creating all the files that we need. So I mentioned briefly that I'm not much of a JavaScript developer. And also I think, you know, these technologies have become fantastically more complicated than when I first started tinkering with JavaScript back when it you know, was in its very early days. And I originally learned Java from Java 1.1 from this particular book. And it was great because this book and another book on Java server programming was enough to get me a job as a Java developer. Whereas now I think things have got much more complicated. So to have a tool like JHipster gives you the advantage of seeing a working application. It also produces the code to a very high standard. So you think, see things like test coverage, you've got things like sonar for checking the um, quality of the code, you've got Docker, all the tools that you'd expect for a, um, start. So switching back to the application, it's still building. Again, this is one of the fascinating things is exactly how much is generated within JHipster. I think I'll be building quickly show. So we can see there are um, 6,000 um, lines of TypeScript that have been developed. There's five and a half thousand lines of Java. There's a whole host of JSON, HTML. Yeah, this is a massive amount of work. So according to this tool here, it reckons there's about 370, the 378 files with 20,000 lines of code in. So 
there's a substantial amount of work that's already going to app our application. And it's still chugging along, should take another 10 or 20 seconds to, to build the initial application. One of the advantages of doing this non-live is you can actually edit out the pauses, which is um, one of the advantages on the 15 minute tutorial I mentioned. I suspect the video is making this slightly slower today, the recording. And as I mentioned, if you've got any questions, just um, pop them in the chat now and I'll answer them now. Otherwise, I think we're going to be at the um, breakout sessions at half seven. So what's the downside with live demos? They always tend to go a little bit slower, a little bit strange when you actually run them live. Let's kick off the application. So at this point, we haven't done any customization of our, of our application towards anything that we're interested in. This is purely the simplest JHipster application we can develop. I want to give you a look just to see what we've got developed at this point, just to give you an idea of the power of this tool and how much of the hard work of setting up an app is done for us. As I mentioned, I always tend to get very just confused when I'm trying to set up, say, things like Spring Security. And the downside is if you get things like that wrong, you build huge flaws into your application that are much tricky to remove later on. While that's starting up, I'm just going to Open this app in IntelliJ. The last little bits there. So, probably a little hard to see um, on the screen, but if we're looking for examples of Java code, so for example, this is the user repository class that handles the user interaction with the database. We've got user service there. We have a whole host of where is it gone? There we go. Whole host of config for our UI. So all the TypeScript and HTML that goes with it. A huge amount of code generated. And if we start up the application now, you see the basic jhipster site. So I log in there with the admin password. Get a warning there that admin is not a very safe password. And we can sort of see roughly what's been produced. So for example, We've got this internationalization. So jhipster has the config files, and every time we now add something new to the site, it knows to add it in Portuguese as well. I'm going to switch that back to English. We have a whole user management system. So we can create new users, we can delete users, we can do everything that we need to do with them with very little trouble. So that's all set for us. There's a full metrics screen. So this gives us details on the history of the application and how it's how well it's working. So incredibly useful, particularly when we're debugging. We've got a set of health endpoints. We've got the config. We've got um, a set of yep, logging configuration. All this stuff comes for free just from a very simple setup. Finally, we have the HT database, which has been set up for us and configured so that we can actually query that to help us with the debugging. The only thing we don't have is this is not a very exciting application yet because we don't actually have any entities built. So this is where I think jhipster for me gets interesting is adding something. So let's imagine we're building a tiny photo sharing site just for us and a few friends. 
So we type in J Hipster Entity Photo. And we get another set of these menus that's asking us how to generate a photo entity. So do we want to add a field to our entity? Let's go with yes. What's the name of your field? Photo. What type is it going to be? So we can pick what type of data we want to store in here. Pick a blob and an image. Do we want to add validation rules? Yep. We'll say it's required. Let me go through this for each of our um, ents and each of our fields in our entities. The next one is title, which is a string. The validation rules here are required, unique. We'll give it a minimum length as well, which is going to be five characters. We'll have one more field for the description. Again, this one will be a blob, so it's a large text field. Validation rules, no. This time we won't add a fourth item, but we do want to add a relationship, a relationship to another entity. So pick yes here. What's the name of the other entity? It's going to be the existing user object. This is going to be the owner of the photo we've put up. Now we can set up the relationship between the objects. So this is one of those things that, again, if I'm working from scratch, I can never quite get right, is working out which side of the joins the um, Hibernate annotations go. So many to one there. Validation rules, yep. We want to make sure that there's always an owner of every image. Turn down creating another entity. At this point, we can say, follow the next set of options, create a service class, we'll create a DTO data transfer object, We'll skip the filtering. The entity is not read-only because we want to edit it. And then we've also got an option for pagination and sorting. So again, a lot of stuff coming for free that's very useful to work with. Now, here it's asking us if we want to update all the files. We say update everything. So JHipster's generators work by constantly rewriting over the files. And we'll come to um, an issue with that in a minute. It's um, both one of the strengths and one of the flaws of JHipster. to the presentation. So what it's done here with our items is it's created an entire database stack, all the changes to create the tables. We've got the JPA entities. We've got the data repository, the REST controllers, all the Angular stuff, which, again, I don't know enough about to easily set up by, ha by hand, and the HTML and CSS for them to appear. We'll kick off the server again. So it's now starting this up, but with the new code we've created for our photo entity. Okay, give that a moment just to start up. slightly slower at the moment than it was in my practices, which I think is the video. And just doing the last bit of the Java. And here we go, the um, regular spring startup here, creating the new, yep, updating the database there. So we can see that that's changed things. Starting up the database. Now we should be able to refresh this and see. So quick refresh. We can now see a photos entity. And what it's done here is it's created a load of test data for us. So that makes it easy to kind of figure out how things are working. We've got an edit page. So very quickly, we've got enough for us to work with. The only drawback at the moment, so very quickly as well, we create a new photo. So. Try new data. 
as we see, when we start typing that up, it wants the fields required. So it's got the checks. This is my description. And we can set the owner. And there we can see our new row. So very quickly, we've got the basics of something to work with. However, with a lot of these things, it takes us only so far. You can actually put this onto production. There's a load of other things we would need. We need the security business logic. We need a mail client set up. So we need some sort of um, mail host for us to send um, email, so particularly for password set up. We need hosting. Um, JHIPS is quite well integrated with um, Heroku, but you know that's that the free option that that will only take you so far. I tend to use um, small digital ocean servers and just pop a runnable jar on there and keep that off. Things like analytics code, monitoring, and also the design. So at the moment, it's very much a generic CRUD page. If we want people to be able to edit, then they're going to be something a little more user friendly, a little bit less, um, a little bit less admin site looking as well. I'm a huge fan of JHIPS, and I've used it with a few different things. Um, there's a site that I run for um, some friends of mine that uses JHipster, and it allows me to do a whole stack in a way that I wouldn't be comfortable with without this sort of tool. The downsides are, firstly, there's a very specific look and feel to it. I think that's a consequence of building a tool like JHipster. You've got to make certain compromises. And breaking out of those can be tricky. However, point two, complex customization can be difficult. So as with all the tools like this, you have to work with the tool rather than breaking out of its frame. You have to be very careful when you're disrupting that. The third issue is that upgrades can tend to be a little bit tricky. As they tend to work with overwriting the files, it can be difficult to maintain your changes. So that's something that I have found tricky. Hopefully I've, I've given you an idea of the opportunity and the, and the power of JHipster. I think the next thing I'd recommend is checking out the JHipster demo, which goes further into some of the little changes you need to make around security just to get something ready for prime time and gives you another good view of things. There's also a JHipster mini book, which I would definitely recommend as a guide to building a slightly more complicated tool in JHipster. But the main thing I'd encourage you to do is, particularly if you're learning new skills to try and pick things up, is to try and make something. This was the um, old ad from a um, punk zine. The idea being that um, the important thing was to get out there and actually do something. So rather than just reading about these things, try and make something. Even if it's a website for you and a dozen friends, you're still going to learn things and it's still going to be exciting. And I think that I say the spectrum of learning from principles up, but also building something, making it, seeing it in action. I think you need both of those things. JHipster for me is a great way for me to dabble with things like JavaScript and to get to learn these new skills. So thank you very much for listening. I'll be around in the Q&A later with any questions. And yeah, enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you.